God, that, that those are big words to sing, that the Spirit would lead us where we have to trust. God, help that to be truth in our hearts today, though, that we would call out to you, God, lead us, fill us with trust. Help us to understand, God, that you, when you call us, when we follow you obediently, is when we are worshiping you in true hearts, God. God, help these not just to be words that we sing, but words that are true of our hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right, this morning we're, we're going to be uh, working on the series that we started earlier this summer. Um, it's a series called Trending Truth. It's a look at several of the evangelical beliefs that evangelicals seem to be drifting away from in the American church. And this is according to a uh, Lifeway and Ligonier poll that was published in 2016. So this is where we're getting the data. And if you wanted to go and look for yourself, you could Google the state of theology and it'll take you directly to that poll, the state of theology in America. Now our topic this morning is a very, very, very crucial one. And it's the Holy Spirit. We're going to speak about the Holy Spirit this morning. According to that Lifeway poll, over 50% of evangelicals that were polled believe that the Holy Spirit is a force and is not a personal being. The Holy Spirit is a force and not a personal being. And so if you're keeping track there at home, according to what we know so far, the average evangelical is actually a Jehovah's Witness right now. They believe that the Jesus is a created being and they believe that the Spirit is a force. And so their view of him is, is not much unlike the idea from the force in Star Wars. I don't know if you're familiar with those movies, but the idea of the force in Star Wars, it's like an impersonal living energy field that you can sort of tap into if you've been trained in the right way to know how to do that and take advantage of that. And you know, I'm not surprised that, that people are confused by the Holy Spirit. Out of all the Trinitarian persons within the being of God, He is the one voted most likely to be misunderstood in my mind. Even the great evangelist Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Moody, once said that he was a member of a church for seven years before he learned that the Holy Spirit was actually a personal member of the Trinity. He believed that the Spirit was a force. And, and we, we understand why this may be confusing because when you say the word Father, you, you can picture a, a, a personal being behind that, couldn't you? That's a personal label. And when we say the word Son, we can picture a personal being behind that. But when you say the word Spirit, what comes to mind? In fact, the word Spirit in the New Testament is the word pneuma in the Greek, which means wind or force. So you could understand why people have misconceptions about the nature of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, a, a full teaching on the Holy Spirit is going to be impossible. It's going to be impossible. We'll, we'll get started on that and then we'll get lost in the details if we try to do that. But regardless, regardless, I can say that the Holy Spirit is all over the Bible. He, he's there at every turn. He's either mentioned directly or his work is there and you can see it. The results of the work of the Holy Spirit are all over. His fingerprints are everywhere within Scripture. But if you could summarize who the Holy Spirit is based on his identity in Scripture, it would sound like this. This is my statement. He is fully God. He is a personality, not a force. He is fully God, a personality and not a force. Now, I'm not going to go into that description with lots of, of scripture study this morning, but I've, I've left you in your sermon notes in the bulletin. If you want to go pursue um, that understanding a little bit in scripture, you can follow those, those references that I've listed underneath that statement in the sermon notes. 
But basically, the Spirit is one of the persons, one of the personalities that exists within the profound Trinitarian being of God. He is a personality and He is God, which means that He possesses all of the qualities of divinity. Whatever God is, He is that. Whatever God's stuff is, He is made out of that. And so what we can say about the other members of the Trinity, we can equally say about the Holy Spirit. He is almighty. He is all-knowing. He possesses perfect knowledge. There is nothing hidden from Him. And He is ever-present. He is equally, and I'm going to say a profound thing that just blows my mind, He is equally everywhere at all times. He is everywhere. And he's morally pure, just like the other members of the Trinity, the Trinity that share in the nature of God. He cannot sin. Sin is against his holy nature. And he's a personality. He's not just a wind. He's not just an, a, an electrical field. He's not something blowing around like as though it's an inanimate force or object. He has a mind. He has a will. He has emotions. He loves he grieves over sin, and he does as he pleases. And so, instead of seeing him as a, an invisible energy source or field, what, what, what we need to do is to see him as holy God. We need to reverence him as holy God, not just some force that we try to tap into and manipulate. This is God, the Holy Spirit. And I know that's really profound, but the point that I want you to come away with about this personal being of the Trinity this morning is not only is, is the Holy Spirit not a force, but He is absolutely essential. He is absolutely essential to you as Christians. Everything that, that God intends you to be in Christ and to do in Christ relies on the Holy Spirit. He's not just some unnecessary member of that trinity. You need Him. You need Him desperately. The Holy Spirit. And so the passage that I want to look at today, and you can begin uh, turning in your Bibles there, is in John chapter 16. I like this passage because I think more than any of the other passages that address the Holy Spirit, this one addresses what He's all about. This is the big picture view of what the Holy Spirit is doing, His role. You know, sometimes we, we tend to get bogged down into the various details of the Holy Spirit's ministry so that we forget what the big picture is. For example, evangelicals like to argue with one another about His spiritual giftings. You know, we like to debate about, uh, you know, whether the miraculous gifts are commonly given or whatever or not. But I would like to submit that that's actually a very small argument within the understanding of the Trinity. I'm sorry, within the understanding of the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you, if you were to write a book about the Holy Spirit, His miraculous or His spiritual gifting would be two paragraphs long on page 437. But yet we blow that one out of proportion and make it seem as though that's all that the Holy Spirit does. So this morning, we're going to look at what I think the book about the Holy Spirit's all about. This is its theme. And we're looking at a passage in which Jesus himself is talking about the Holy Spirit. Is that a pretty good source to go to to understand the Holy Spirit? To go directly to the words of Christ? I think so. And this passage is set on the night before his crucifixion. And he's preparing the men he's talking to, his disciples... The men who would become the apostles of the church, who would help found the church, he's preparing his disciples for his leaving. He was going to leave. Not only would he die the next day, but he would soon, some 50 days after this, ascend into heaven. And his physical presence on earth was no longer going to be with his followers. And so, the world that rejected Christ and the world that resisted Christ was going to pour out that rejection 
and resistance toward his followers he left behind. And so this was a, a pretty shell-shocked bunch of disciples sitting in that room with Jesus. They were sorrowful over the fact that Jesus was leaving them. They, they were daunted at the fact that they were carrying on his ministry without him. But Jesus says, I want you to be comforted. Don't you worry about this. Because I am sending the Holy Spirit. He's going to come upon the church in a very special way way. He calls the Spirit a helper, someone that is going to come to their aid. And he says something remarkable that I just want us to drink in deeply this morning. He says, it is better that you have the Spirit than if I stuck around. It is better that the Spirit comes to you than me being with you. I mean, we need to think about that because we're, we're standing on the other side of this, right? And we have the Spirit, but we don't have the physical presence of Jesus Christ, do we? But yet we have it better. And I, I know there are times when we think, well, what? I, I, would, I would just love to walk around in Galilee and run into Jesus. I mean, take a look at him and, and see what he's doing with his teaching and watch him perform miracles and, and all that stuff. And, and I would have loved to have been there that morning when he rose from the grave. I would, have, I would have loved to have seen him walk out of that tomb. I would have loved to have seen him in a resurrected body. But Jesus is saying, no, you want the Spirit instead. You want the Holy Spirit. It is better. So let's see what Jesus says about the coming helper. John chapter 16, let's begin in verse 5. Talking to his disciples, he says, But now I am going to him who sent me. And none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, there's that remarkable thing. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth, for He will not speak on His own authority. But whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify Me, for He will take what is Mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine, and therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now, I want us to begin with by taking a careful look at the beginning of verse 14. Take a look at the beginning of verse 14. This is where I believe you find a summary statement of the role of the Holy Spirit. And we see from that phrase there at the beginning of the verse that the Spirit has come to glorify Jesus Christ. There you go. That is the umbrella statement. That's what the book on the Holy Spirit is all about. All of His work then in the world and in the church is pointing to that one end. It's the penultimate work of the Holy Spirit. He has come to declare the greatness of the Son of God in Jesus Christ, who came to die for the sins of the world. It is the passion of the Spirit to exalt the Son. And if he were, if he were in here right now, and he were passing out his own personal business card to every one of you this morning, if the Holy Spirit was actually doing that, he would, above his name and above his phone number, have at the very top of that card, I glorify Jesus Christ. And if he possessed a car, his vanity plate would say, I glorify Jesus Christ. The Son of God and the man Jesus Christ is standing on the center stage of glory. And it's the Spirit who is the revealer. 
He is the one who opens the eyes of the heart of individuals so that they can see the glory of Jesus Christ. He is the Son's co-equal in the Trinity, but yet He is taking a secondary role in glory. He is the one pulling the curtain back from the stage so that we can see Christ for who He truly is in faith. The Spirit is the revealer. And sometimes because of that, the Spirit is called the shy member of the Trinity. It's because He never takes that center stage. He's always glorifying another member. And this is important to know. Many people think that I really want to find a Spirit-filled church. I really want to find a Spirit-led church. And what they're going around is, and looking for are, are sort of miraculous manifestations in that church. Or, or perhaps one that's very emotional. Maybe even for emotion's sake. But those views about the Spirit are wrong. A Spirit-led church is one that is absolutely fascinated with Jesus Christ. Because they get Him. They understand Him. They see Him because the Spirit has revealed who Jesus Christ is to, him, to them in a glorious way. And so if you want to find where the Spirit is at work, look for a church that is passionate about Jesus. Look for people who understand the great worth and the excellence of Jesus Christ. They savor Jesus Christ. They, like the Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3, say, I, I, just, I just love Christ. And I just want to know the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ. He, he is the most valuable thing to know, not in just an academic way, but in a spiritual perception way. He is more valuable than anything else. Everything else pales in comparison to Jesus Christ. And so look for a spirit-filled church by looking for people who love Jesus Christ. They cherish Christ, because the Spirit has revealed the glory of Jesus Christ to them. And Jesus, in this passage, mentions two separate ways in which the Spirit has done this. First, in verses 8 through 11, we see that the Spirit glorifies Christ to the world through conviction. He's glorifying Christ to the world through conviction. Conviction, verses 8 through 11. In those verses, we see here that Jesus is describing a series of three convictions that the Spirit is, is trying to induce within the world. And all of these convictions are designed, I want you to see this, to drive the world toward Christ, to see their need for Christ and turn to Him. He says He convicts us of our sin. He, he convicts us also, what I believe He's saying here about righteousness, is our need for righteousness. He convicts us of our sin and our need for righteousness, He says here. He convicts us of our judgment. And I believe what He's talking about is our prior faulty judgments about Jesus Christ. Because we don't see and savor Jesus until we understand just how desperately we need Him. The Spirit produces our sense of need through conviction. And so that's how the Spirit drives us to the glory of Jesus Christ. He reveals the need. He is inducing repentance. So that when we turn from our sin, we see Christ and He is the most beautiful thing then that we have ever seen revealed to us. The Spirit is kind of like one of those annoying in-car navigation systems. You know the one that, that talks to you? Hey, you? Anybody in here have an in-car navigation system that tells you where to go? They're a little bossy, aren't they? And, and, and even, if, even if you know where you want to go and how you want to do it, they don't like that. And so they're telling you always to turn around. And the Spirit is kind of like that. What, he, what He's saying is, turn around. Turn around. Christ is back that way. Turn back to Christ. He's over there. And that's what His conviction produces, is the sort of desire to turn and to embrace Christ through faith. You know, and, I, and maybe, maybe this is true in your same experience, is that I have found the people who love Jesus Christ 
more than anyone else, the people who treasure Christ fully are the ones who had a deep sense of their need. They had a deep sense of their need. And they love Christ because they understand where they came from when Christ was revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. And it's a beautiful thing to see somebody that's like that. You don't have to, don't have to twist their arms on a Sunday morning to sing praises about Jesus Christ. You have to tell them to stop because it's sermon time. Because of their love of Jesus Christ. They're beautiful. Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit has taken them from the absolute depths of despair to new heights and glory. Standing in the grace of God, that's Jesus Christ. And their love of Christ is great because they know that their need is great. And listen, I wish that every one of us would have an understanding of how great our need is for Christ. And I wish that we would have fresh senses of that sometimes. That we would get a, a new sense of how much we desperately need Christ. And so I'm going I'm to assist the Holy Spirit this morning in the role of conviction, okay? And so I'm going to make a statement. Do you love God with every fiber of your being? Be honest. All that you are, do you, does it just, just love God? Does it just want to just exalt Him in praise at all times? Then you need Christ. All of us fall short of the glory of God. Some of us really see it and understand how desperately we need Jesus Christ. Everyone's a sinner in here like me. Everyone in here lacks righteousness like me. And, and everyone in here has had faulty prior judgments about Christ. Maybe they thought he was just sort of a teacher or just somebody in the Bible or somebody, somebody in, in the historical record of mankind. But it's the Spirit who gives us a sense of who Christ is. And we need Christ like we need air. That's our position spiritually before God. You need Jesus Christ like you need air to breathe. And the Spirit aims to glorify Christ through that conviction. Second way in this passage we see the Spirit glorify Christ here is in verses 12 through 15. It's through the teaching of the apostles. It's through the teaching of the apostles. Jesus here in 12 through 15 is speaking to the men who would become the apostles of the church. And they would have a very unique Holy Spirit driven and given ministry to exalt Jesus Christ. He's speaking about here what I believe is how the Spirit would inspire their minds to declare the glorious message of Christ. And we then are the blessed recipients of that message that the Spirit formed in the minds of the apostles. The truth that was forged in there. And so what we see here is what I believe to be a very profound and fascinating chain of revelation about the truth of Christ. The truth about God in these verses. And we are the ones, I want you to see this, that are actually standing at the end of that chain. And we are the recipients of that truth that's being passed along. And we receive it because the Spirit opens our eyes to it. And basically, Jesus says it this way. This is kind of confusing, I know. All that the Father has is mine. The Holy Spirit then is going to take what is mine and He's going to give it to you, talking to the apostles. And in doing that, the Spirit will glorify Jesus Christ. And so what I think that they're passing along here, what is mine and I'm giving it to you, is they're passing along in this sequence the revealed knowledge of both the Father and the Son. It's revelation of the Father and the Son. And it spills out through one member of the Trinity to another and down to the apostles and to us. That's what he's talking about. And so it sounds kind of like this. Jesus, in his time here on earth, was the exact representation of the invisible God. 
He perfectly revealed God the Father to us. He taught and he submitted to the will of the Father. His mission was to reveal the glory of the Father. He was the one that was pulling back the curtain so that we can understand who the Father is. Okay? Then the Spirit is going to do the same thing for the Son. He is going to perfectly reveal the knowledge of the Son. He is the one pulling back the curtain on the Son so that we can see Him for who He truly is. That He is the Son of God in power come to the world in human flesh to die for our sins. And the Spirit is placing that perfect knowledge of the Son into the minds of the apostles in a process called inspiration. And he's going to work in them in such a way that they would perfectly declare the truth about Jesus Christ. And so as they proclaimed the gospel and as they wrote the words of the New Testament, it was the Spirit who was speaking through them. And so this is where you win an argument. Where somebody says, uh, I don't know that the New Testament are the words of God. Well, you go to this verse. This is how it's explained by Christ that the, the Spirit is going to give the apostles the very words of God. So, it is their Spirit giving, given understanding of the gospel that then we take and declare to the world. So we're standing at the end of this cascading chain of revelation. And, and the Spirit helps anybody who comes to the end of that chain see and understand the truth about Jesus Christ. So think about it this way. Whenever you declare the gospel, here is what you are doing. With your words, you are painting a picture of Jesus Christ and what He did. And the Spirit uses that picture to apply to the hearts of people who would receive Him in faith. The Spirit does the work of creating faith in the heart. We give Him the picture to work with when we declare the gospel. He is working through the declaration of the gospel. Peter tells us we are born again by that gospel. It's the Spirit working through the glorious picture of Jesus Christ when we declare the gospel. That is why you have to declare the gospel with words. People don't see Jesus Christ and the gospel if you're just giving them a bowl of soup. The gospel was meant to be declared so the Spirit could apply the truth of it to the hearts of people. And He gives them spiritual perception says in the scripture that no one genuinely says that Jesus Christ is Lord apart from the Spirit. Spirit-enabled perception. No one can say that He's Lord and mean it. He opens the eyes of the heart so that we might see Christ for who He is. And so it's like this. It's like people are lost out, out at sea and it's night and, and there's a cloud covering. And so you can't, you can't see anything under these conditions. And, and you have a sense that you are drowning. But you don't know what to do about it. It's the Holy Spirit then who shines a light onto a life preserver that's right there where you can grab it, attached to a helicopter that can pull you out. And that life preserver is like Christ. He's shining the light of on Jesus Christ so that we can understand Him and embrace Him through faith. Now that's not a perfect analogy because Christ is more than just some sort of practical means you use for salvation. He is holy God and He deserves to be worshipped. But that's what the Spirit does. He gives us that spiritual perception. And that's why, church, we need to be a church that knows how to share the gospel. We, we need to be people who can create that word picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ that the Spirit can use and work through so that people can have the eyes of their heart open to see Jesus. And we ought to be a people who say, 
Do you, do you want to know just how glorious my Jesus is? Then let me share my gospel with you. Let, let, me, let me show you a picture of the glorious Son of God, Jesus Christ. That's what the gospel is painting a picture of, that the Spirit applies. And so the stated purpose, the great passion of the Spirit, is the glory of Jesus Christ. He wants to glorify Christ in the world. He wants to glorify Christ through the gospel message of the apostles. And lastly, he wants to glorify Christ to you. Or to be more specific, to you, in you, and through you. This, this powerful and personal member, holy God of the Trinity wants to take your business cards and He wants to stamp at the very top for the glory of Jesus Christ. He wants to take the vanity plates off your car and put on a new one for the glory of Jesus Christ. He is all about that in your life too. He wants to write the glory of Jesus Christ in your very heart. And all that the Spirit is doing in your life is funneling you to that one purpose. He revealed the glory of Jesus Christ to you. If you are a believer, He lifted the veil of unbelief over the eyes of your heart that blinded you to who Jesus was. And you saw Him for the first time when the Gospel was presented. You were given that glorious picture of Christ and you turned and you embraced Him in faith. And after He revealed the glory of Christ to you, then His desire then is to form the glory of Christ in you. When the, when the Spirit removes that veil and we see Christ, we are slowly, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we are slowly and inwardly being transformed from one degree of glory to another into what we are looking at. And the Spirit is doing that. He wants an inner transformation of you that glorifies Jesus Christ. The Spirit is forming the character of Christ into your very soul. And He's fitting you to look like and to act like a genuine child of God. This is called sanctification. This is called holiness. And we call Him the Holy Spirit because He is about our holiness. He is the one working to affect holiness in you, which looks like the character of Jesus Christ. And so if you want to frustrate the Spirit, if you want to grieve the Spirit, then you are going to try to do something to, to not cooperate with that process that He has in you. That will frustrate the Spirit of God. His desire to bring about that transformation. He is passionate about the glory of Christ. He also wants the glory of Christ to be revealed through you. Not just to you and in you, but through you. He wants you to be an instrument through which the glory of Jesus Christ then is, is, is passed on to the world. He wants you to have a new set of tastes and desires that are motivated by a love for Christ. He wants you to do something for Christ. He wants you to roll up your sleeves, get your finger, fingernails dirty, and go to work for Jesus Christ. Serve Him. Get out of your comfort zone. Risk things for Christ so that the glory of Jesus Christ can be displayed through what you do. That is the Spirit's passion. And if I were to identify one thing as your pastor that I have a passion about for you, that's my passion. You heard it this morning. You heard it. I was, uh, I was told as I was learning how to be a pastor and I read some church growth books that modern pastors are supposed to cast a vision to their people. But then I read in an article on Babylon B that there was a pastor that cast a vision and got it stuck underwater on one of the trees or something, or undergrowth, uh, a brush underneath the water or something, couldn't pull it out. So I'm, I'm not real sure that casting a vision is actually a pastoral qualification. In fact, I, people ask me, what's your vision for the church? I say, I already accomplished it. I had a vision that there would be a curtain installed in the men's bathroom over one of the stalls. <laughs> and I did that. 
I'm not sure what to do next. But, I do have a burden in my heart. This is the thing that I am most passionate about. Is that you would be a people that get Christ. Not just in an academic sense, not just in a doctrinal sense, but in an I had my eyes open, the eyes of my heart sense. And I see Him as glorious. And therefore I am motivated by a great affection that I have for Him. You know, our mission statement says at the very beginning, motivated by the love of Christ. I don't want that to be words. I'm done with words. I want that to be real. And if you want to know what I pray for most of all, when I pray for this church, I say, Father, by your Spirit, would you please give us a fresh sense of Jesus Christ? Give us a taste of His glory. There are some of us that are running on duty and obligation, and I don't want to disappoint my wife. As a part of a church, those are our motives oftentimes. But boy, what I wouldn't give to see it be, I love Jesus Christ. Would you join me in praying that and wanting that? Now, before we close this morning, can I paint a beautiful picture that the Holy Spirit might need to use? Jesus Christ, the Son of God in glory. Do you get that? Son of God in eternal glory. Magnificent glory. The one whom Isaiah caught a glimpse of and said, Oh, woe is me. The Son of God in eternal glory said, you have prepared a body for me. Fit me with a human body, with a human nature that I might go and engage in the world that has resisted me. That I might die for it. Brutal death on the cross under the wrath of God for you. Rose again proving God's power to forgive you. Proving the legitimate nature of the act, the sacrifice that was given on the cross. Days later, taken back into heaven. The right hand of the Father. In his position of former glory that we might worship him. Do you see the beauty? Do you see the glory of Jesus Christ? May the Spirit give you eyes if you don't. If you have any questions about what that means, would you please talk to me or another of our pastors? We want you to know and to love the gospel. Let's pray. Father, we just... Uh, we just thank you for the Spirit. I wouldn't be here praying. I wouldn't be here loving Jesus Christ today. I wouldn't understand who Jesus Christ is. I'd be so helpless. And I know we direct our prayers to you through your Son. But I, I, I say, Spirit, thank you so much. <laughs> Forgive us. We, we, we don't understand how reliant... That we are on you. 
Father, as a church, would you give a new and fresh sense of who Jesus Christ is, that we may actually live the mission statement that we have that says motivated by the love of Christ. Thank you, Father, for the great gift that the Holy Spirit is to us, that we might see the great gift you've given us in your Son. And we pray this in His holy name. Amen. Let's stand together as we close.